You're listening to Nightlight. Hi, and welcome once again to the Nightlight podcast. Nice to be with you as always, and nice to have back with us David Karan, one of the wonderful Bible teachers we're so blessed to have as regular contributors to this program. The topic David has chosen for today is on the wisdom books in the Bible, and as always, he has some fresh insights that I know we're going to find fascinating as well as uplifting and empowering. David, the show is yours. Take it away. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. All right, so just a little bit of biblical history. As we know, the Bible that we have today was originally written over a period of over 1,500 years. And it was originally the Jewish scriptures, which then was passed on to the early church, which was then added on with their writings and canonized into what we currently have as our Bible today. The New Testament from the early church writings and the Old Testament from the ancient Hebrew writings, beginning with the books of Moses and then transitioning all the way through the period up until 400 BC. And it was around 400 BC that actually the the Old Testament, the books that are currently we now have in our Bible as the Old Testament, it was around 400 BC that those were canonized and were translated into Greek and called the Septuagint, which was eventually what came to the early church. And so the, the reason why it's important to know is because the Jewish scriptures were very, very precious to the Jews. That's right. Because they, they embodied basically the story of God's covenant people. As a Jewish person, as a, as a child of Abraham, as an Israelite, what you would happen is you, were, you would grow up learning these things. Right, you would spend the first part of your of your adolescence studying the five books of the Torah until you were able to um, and you knew them well enough to read and recite, and you were fa- and you were familiar with all the laws of the Sinai Covenant, about 623 of them. Once you had reached the level of wisdom in that, then you had your bar mitzvah, which made you into the equivalent of a Jewish adult. And then from then, you would continue on your studies through the scriptures. And they had a lot of different traditions that you have to study. You had the Torah, you had the Talmud, you had the prophets, you had the law, you had all those different things together. And then they had these very interesting books, which were called the wisdom books the wisdom series, or as we nowadays call it, the wisdom tradition. And the reason why I started getting into this is because of the book of James, actually. Really? And the book of James, we have James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, and he is a Jew from the Jewish tradition who, as a child, would have grown up with these Uh, rabbinic traditions of the Torah and the Talmud and the wisdom. And so when he's talking to uh, the Messianic Jews, because James, at the time of writing his letter, was the head of the church in Jerusalem, the people he was talking to would also have grown up with these books. And so one thing that I've learned a lot this year, and this is something that I really encourage a lot of you who are doing deeper Bible studies and really want to know more, Anytime you hear a word from the Bible that gives you a modern day interpretation of it, go back and look at it in the original context. And so if James is talking about wisdom, being a Jew, talking to Jews, my interest and curiosity was, okay, let's go and look back. What was the wisdom tradition that the Jews were familiar with? And so I did. And what I learned from that just totally blew me away. Wow. In our Bibles that we have today, whether you have the King James in front of you, whether you have the NIV, the ESV, or whatever V you have, there are three wisdom books that are absolutely pivotal in the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job. Right. These were considered to be the wisdom tradition of the Old Testament. Now, there's a very interesting pattern of the way that they link together, and they all tell a very, very interesting story of how wisdom applies to our life. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a bird's eye view of these books. Cool. And I would love if you would have the opportunity to go and study them for yourself. In fact, I encourage you to do it, but we're not going to have a chance to go through everything. But let me just give you an overview. Super. The first book 
of wisdom is the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is the Proverbs of Solomon and also other compiled wisdom from the kings at that particular time. And it is a very awesome book. It's a book of various sayings about wisdom. And the idea and concept behind the book of Proverbs is that this is the right thing to do. This is the wrong thing to do. Here is wisdom. And doing these other things are not so wise. So therefore, do the right things. If you do the th right things, then you will experience good results. If you do the wrong things, you will experience bad results. And so if you do the right things, that is considered wisdom. And all the way through the book of Proverbs, you see this thread being played out. It is, you know, for example, the slothful person is the one who starves in the winter. If you're lazy, you're going to starve to death. So don't be lazy, work hard, and then you'll be successful. Right. There's a very, very thin line between black and white in the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs, everything is stark. You know, here is the black, here is the white. You don't want to be on, on the wrong side. You don't want to be on the side that suffers because there's things that you do that make your life good. There are things that if you don't do them, your life's going to be terrible. So choose wisdom, do the right things, and your life will be successful. This is the message of the book of Proverbs, and this is what they called wisdom. And wisdom is knowing what things you need to do that are good, what things that if you don't do are bad, and how to balance yourself properly so that you're making the right choices in every aspect of your life. And this is the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. Right. However, there are a few things that are missing from the book of Proverbs. And I will get back to that in a second because you know who actually calls up the mistakes in the book of Proverbs? No. Solomon oh. himself. He calls it out in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the book of Ecclesiastes, we are introduced to a very interesting character. Now, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's actually written by two people. There's an orator, and then there's a person who he calls the preacher. And basically, the narrator introduces this guy, and this guy talks for 11 chapters, and then the 12th chapter, the narrator summarizes what he's talking about. So, this is how it's understood. The preacher, actually, in the book of Proverbs, or I think, I think the word preacher is a little bit of a, I think, a kind of like a misconstrued thing. If I think of you actually have to weigh in on his characteristics, this guy's more of a critic. Okay. Like, he's one of those people who give uh, critical observations on everything. And he spends 11 chapters basically just tearing down the wisdom of Proverbs. I never thought of that. Because Proverbs made everything black and white. If you do good, good will happen. If you do bad, bad will happen. So choose wisdom and do good. Right. But the critic in Ecclesiastes says, wait a minute. The good guy chooses to do good and does good and then dies. And everything he has, he loses. He might die in an accident. He might get struck by lightning. You know, weevils might eat his field. And the bad guy, who makes all the wrong decisions, has a very good life because he might be so lazy, but his dad made a lot of money, and so he inherits it and lives off that for the rest of his life. Yes. And so the critic in the book of Ecclesiastes says, wait a minute, life is not fair. What Proverbs is saying is very naive because although it is good counsel, there are laws that govern the world and there are principles that if you do good, good happens. You do bad, bad happens. And so do good, but don't do bad. But then he says there is an unseen element of life, which is kind of unfair, that bad things still happen to good people and good th things still happen to bad people. And he says, how do we account for that? And so he's a little bit cynical in the way he does it, but he also brings up a very beautiful illustration. He calls life a vapor, mm -hmm. okay? He says it's like mist. The word that is currently translated as vanity in the King James Version actually means like a vapor, like a mist. It's like steam. Hmm. You can't grasp it. You can't control it. You don't know where it's going. It's beautiful to look at, 
but you have absolutely no control over what happens. Just like you can't control the air and just like you can't control the steam that is coming out of your cup of coffee on a cold morning, you can't control your life. Right. And so he says it is desperately naive to think that anything is under your control. However, the narrator doesn't really agree with that. And the narrator summarizes his critics in chapter 12. Mm -hmm. And in chapter 12, the narrator basically gives his opinion on what the critic has been saying for the past 11 chapters. And he says, look, he's absolutely correct. There are things that happen. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. You don't really know. Life is like a vapor, which you can't control. But there is a time and a season to everything under heaven. And God is the one who is responsible for that. So even though you don't understand, still you need to do good. Still you have to pursue wisdom. Still you have to do the right things. Even if you do the right things and everything falls apart, you should still do it because that is what's required of you. You might not understand life, but you should still try your best to live it in the right ways. Yes. And that is the summary of the book of Ecclesiastes. And so if we were to give these books personifications, mm -hmm. okay, let's just say that the book of Proverbs is like this bright eyed um, young lawyer who has just graduated from law school and is ready to take on the world. Okay. Okay. She sees the world in the terms of black and white. Why am I using the term she? Because in the book of Proverbs, it displays wisdom as feminine, which is quite cool. So she is this, um, this person who has just come out of college, who is ready to take on the world, sees everything as black and white, and is desperately campaigning for people to do the right thing because they do the right thing and they just get their lives on the right track. Things will go so much better. And that is her wisdom. However, if we want to personify the second book, the second book is like this old critic who has lived his life. He's probably just past, you know, middle age. He's in his 50s or something. And he's been burnt by life because life didn't really go how he intended to. And he's saying, look, you can be bright eyed and you can say all these different things and you can want all these things to happen. But generally speaking... Life does not always go your way because you can't control it. And so there seems to be this overall arcing tension between what was written in the book of Proverbs and what was written in the book of Ecclesiastes. Interesting. Enter in the third book of wisdom, the book of Job. And Job is one of the most incredible books in the entire Bible. In fact, it is the oldest text that is available to us from the ancient world. Yes. And so the book of Job is a story about this guy who is a perfect person, has never done anything wrong, who lives his life firmly in following what God wants to do, and yet his entire world falls apart. Like absolutely and totally just falls apart. He loses all his fortune. He loses his house. He loses his family. All his children die. He loses his own health as well. He's covered in, in boils and he's suffering. And he is struggling to come to grips with what is going on in his life. And he's like, wait a minute. All I've ever done is good and all I've ended up with is bad. And he doesn't realize this. And so he starts to struggle with it in his own mind. And then he gets three friends to come visit him. And these three friends come and they start having a very intellectual debate with him. Right. And these three friends, believe it or not, everything they say sounds like the book of Proverbs. Hmm. Okay. So good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and so you must have done something bad for something for this to have happened. And they start discussing these different things, even creating scenarios, like maybe when you were asleep and you were dreaming, you talked in your sleep, and in your sleep talk, you said something bad, and that is why all these things have happened to you. Right. And the entire time, Job is like, no, that's not true. And Job is actually thinking through everything they're saying, and he's responding and saying, but that's not the case. So much so that he goes from being a broken man in the first few chapters of the book to being a very angry and arrogant person halfway through because he's like, hey, if what they're saying is true, then I'm innocent and something is wrong. 
because they've they've all said that things don't bad things only happen if I've done wrong things, but I've done nothing wrong and nothing. I've looked at every aspect of my life. Everything is perfect. I've lived a perfect life to this point. This is not fair. And then he switches his, his conversation from his friends. He's like, look, you guys are all ignorant. You don't know anything. And he starts talking to God. And he's like, God, what you're doing is unfair because you're supposed to reward good and judge evil. You're supposed to do all those different things. Good things are supposed to happen to good people and bad things will happen to bad people. And yet I am suffering. What is wrong with you? And he starts this whole intellectual debate. And in fact, if you read the book of Job, it's such a beautiful, beautiful compilation of this very dense and deep poetry. And it's like the heart cry of one man trying to reason his faith out with God and saying, why have these things happen to me? I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And finally, in chapter 38, God shows up. And this is the coolest thing. God shows up. And what God does is completely unexpected. Okay. I love it. You read the first couple of verses. God shows up and God tells Job, get up, pull up your pants like a man and come talk to me face to face. Right. And you can just picture Job getting up there, pulling up his pants. He's like, all right, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> and God says, answer me one question. Job's like, I'm ready. I've been waiting all these days for you to show up. I've got a lot of things to talk to you about. I think there's ways that you're running the world that are not seeming right and fair. You're not doing a good job as God. Come have this conversation with me. And God looks at him and says, just answer me one question. And Job's like, all right, shoot. And God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? And you can just picture Job going, oh, man, sits back down because it's true. Where was he? Mm -hmm. He wasn't there. He has no idea. And then God spends the next two and a half chapters just asking Job all these questions of which he knows nothing about. Do you know how to control light? Do you know how to bring rain? Do you know how to make things grow? Are you the one who feeds the animals and makes sure there's a balance in the natural world? Are you the one who can cause everything to happen properly? Are you the one who oversees every little thing in existence? Right. And then he says... After showing him everything, he then begins to show him using very metaphorical language, which is super awesome, talking about the chaos of being. And he's like, can you actually control that? There is so much in your life that you have no idea about. Can you actually do anything to control the state of this universe? And then he does something which is really, really cool. He tells Job, okay, so using your limited knowledge, why don't you judge the world? He says, I'm going to give you the power right now to reward all good and judge all evil using what you currently know. Go ahead. And Job says, I cannot. I thought I was right, but I realize I'm ignorant. And now I repent in dust and ashes. And there's something very interesting about this entire conversation. God never tells him why he did what he did. God never once tells him, this was something that I orchestrated. This was, this was something that happened because the devil did this for these reasonings. God never gives him any reasoning whatsoever. But that's the beauty of the book, is because that is the lesson of the entire book. You may not know what's happening, but you can't know because you have zero understanding at a cosmic level. The book of Isaiah 55, God says that my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do a bit of research and look through the Hubble telescope and just see how vast the expanse of the universe is, it's enormous. And God says that's the difference between your thoughts and my thoughts. Your best thought on your best day falls trillions and trillions and trillions of light years short of what God is thinking. And so the message of the book of Job and the encapsulation of the wisdom of Job is that you might not always know, but God knows. So you have to trust him because he has a plan. And so if we want to personify the book of Job, we can personify him like an older man who has seen life, who has wrestled with his questions, and he's come to peace at the end of it. And said, you know what? 
at the end of the day, God's in control. And so this is the wisdom tradition of the Old Testament. Wow. Proverbs tells us, do good, good will happen. Do bad, bad will happen. So wisdom is choosing to do good. Ecclesiastes tell us, well, yes, bad things will happen to good people. And good things will happen to bad people because that's just life. You can't control it. It's like a vapor in your hands. It's like steam that you're trying to grasp at. But still, you should do good because you know that is the right thing to do. And wisdom is choosing to do good even if bad things end up happening. Right. Now get this. This is the coolest part of the entire thing. Job tells us that bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. You have no idea about it. You can't control it. But God controls it. And so you trust him because he is infinite, he is cosmic, and he is over all. Inspiring you to draw closer to God, you're listening to Nightlight. Nightlight. And then... And this is where you get the goosebumps. This is where it starts coming in. And this is where I, I got so amazed. Okay. Then comes in the wisdom of James. James spends his entire book talking about wisdom. The wisdom that is from above. And he's telling this to the Messianic Jews, the people who have believed and accepted Christ as their Savior. He says, this is the truth, and this is wisdom. He's building off the wisdom tradition of the Old Testament. And what he's saying is, if you read the book of James, he says two very important things. The first thing James says is that we know this God. We know this Jesus because this Jesus came and dwelt among us. We see that wow. in the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so James says, We know this God. Right. We know him personally. We know his love because we've seen it. And then James says something even more amazing. James says, and we know he is coming back. We know that he is returning. And so now what spin has James put on the entire thing? What does wisdom look like to us as Christians in this modern day and age? Proverbs told us, do good, good will happen. Do bad, bad will happen. So do good. And that's wisdom. Ecclesiastes says you have no idea what's going to happen, but you still do good anyway. And that's wisdom. Job says terrible things might happen, but God's still in control. And that is wisdom. And then James says, and we know the heart of that God because we've seen him. Yes. And we've interacted with him. And we have seen the love that he's shown us. And because of that love, we trust in him. And he left us a promise that he is coming back. And when he comes back, he will set everything right. Yes. And that is wisdom. And that is why James can take that wisdom and apply it to the lives of the people he was writing to who were living in pretty messed up times for sure and if you have your bible with you um could you read james chapter yeah. 1 verse 1 through 5. james a servant of god and of the lord jesus christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting my brethren count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Okay, so this is what James is saying. James is saying, is life tough right now? Yes, of course it's tough. 
it's miserable. And if you actually understand the the context of the people he was writing to, this was written at a time when the people in Jerusalem were suffering enormously. That's right. This was a time of famine. This was a time that was there was pestilence there. There was uh, people were suffering. There was a lot of uh, major persecutions. This was also when the threat from Rome was imminent. And within a couple of years, the Romans actually came and destroyed Jerusalem. So this is this is very very present in times of deep trouble and everything and James's message to them is you can find joy in this you can find happiness in this you can find exceeding gladness Wow he says you can count it all joy because the trying of your faith works patience and patience if allowed to have her perfect work will make you complete and entire lacking nothing and he says but for that you need the wisdom because remember, everything in your life can either look like opportunities or obstacles. And what is it that enables you to circumnavigate those obstacles and move into opportunities? As psychologists told us, it is wisdom. That's right. And this is the wisdom that James says. In your life right now, are you stuck? In your life right now, do you feel overwhelmed with these obstacles that are all around you? In your life, are you seeing that you are suffering and you are wondering, well, what is happening over here? What is God doing? What is this? Why is this mess going on? Yes. And it could be very easy for us to look at the book of Proverbs and say, God's got something wrong going on here because if good things are supposed to happen to people who do good and bad things are supposed to happen to things that people who do bad, then why are we currently sitting like the critic from Ecclesiastes and saying, yes, but it seems like all the good people are suffering and evil is going on, you know, unpunished and all the good seems to be going on unrewarded. And so and then we might bring up the book of Job as a bit of consolation and say, well, God knows what we don't. And so we just have to trust him for it. But then there's more than that. There's the message of James that says, we know this God. We know him personally. We can have a relationship with him. We know his love because as Paul says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ came and died for us. And then he left us a promise that he is returning. He left us a promise that he is coming back. And as we see all the way through the New Testament, he has always promised that when he comes, he will set things right. Thank you, Jesus. Then will all evil be finally dealt with. Then will all good be eternally rewarded. And then everything will make sense. Amen. But right now, we need to live today with that focus in our life. And that is the final concluding message of the book of James. James says, we know this God personally, we know his love, and we know he's coming back. So live your life today to get ready for that. Amen. What did he ask you to be doing while he was gone? Go and do that. Make sure that you are living in the right way. Make sure that you are pursuing wisdom. Make sure that you are building your relationship with Christ and doing the works that he would have you do. So that way, even if it looks like you're never awarded for that in this life, even though it looks like things never pan out the way that you want it, even though it looks like, hey, you know, evil is going unpunished and the good people are suffering the most. Right. That's where wisdom comes in. Wisdom that allows you to transcend your obstacles right now. Wow. Through knowing that everything is one day going to work together for God's purpose and that God is in control and he is the one who will work everything out for his purposes and all we need to do is trust and obey. And that is the wisdom of Christians from the biblical wisdom tradition. Nightlight. You're listening to an international edition of Nightlight, shining God's love light to the world. Well, thanks, David, for that terrific class. What should we call the class? Any ideas? Maybe the necessity of wisdom or something about wisdom. I don't know. I actually didn't really think about it because it's not exactly a class I put together. It's, it's just my own studies for myself that I've been kind of wrestling with over the year. And 
this eventually came right. out of it. So I haven't really got a topic for it, but oh, let's call let, let's call it what James calls it. Can you read verse chapter three, verse seventeen? But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. All right, let's call this the wisdom that is from above. Because Good. once Good. you take that wisdom from above, that knowledge that God is in control and he's going to work everything out, and our job is just to be faithful because we trust him and because we love him, because we know his love. And as James says, that produces, that is, that is pure. That knowledge is pure. And then it produces peace. It produces gentleness and humility. It produces within us an ability to work along well with other people, and it fills us with mercy, and it brings about good fruit in our life without partiality and without hypocrisy. And that, I believe, is what we're all after. Those sound a lot like the fruits of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. And mm -hmm. as we know, that, that fruit comes from abiding in Jesus from being with him, but at the same time, also maintaining the right perspective. And mm -hmm. as James says, the perspective of the wisdom from above. We will leave on those closing words. Thanks for the opportunity. Always appreciate it. And thank you so much, David Karang. And David, by the way, has a whole library of his classes on his Patreon platform, and he's adding new ones all the time. His page is called Dive deep with Dave, and I'll add the link below. This is Chris Glynn signing off, and I'll be with you very soon once again for another Nightlight podcast. God bless you. Bye for now.